My name is Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and I'm the current president of this Royal Society, and it is a, a very great pleasure to welcome you. This is officially an ordinary meeting of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, or of its fellows. So we will have a little bit of business to do, but the prime thing this evening is the lecture that you've come for, and for a few other people to receive some medals. Let's start, however, right at the beginning. The Royal Society of Edinburgh is Scotland's national academy. Intellectual leaders, leaders from business, practicing artists, and uh, we cover, I think, just about the whole gamut. It's a science talk this evening, but as well as scientists, we have social scientists, people from the humanities and the arts, as well as business and finance and so on. The business of the ordinary meeting is the following. The minutes of the last meeting are available in reception. A list of recently deceased fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh is available in reception. Uh, over the next few months, we'll be running a ballot for new fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And I have to inform you that we've appointed two scrutineers for that ballot. They're Professor Jane Dawson of the University of Edinburgh and Professor Alan Welch of Heriot Watt University. And at the ordinary meeting in March, the outcome of that ballot will be announced and the new fellows will be admitted in May. All that is much as in previous years. So turning to the, the rest of this evening's business, the first thing I have to advise you is that I'm going to present a couple of medals. The first medal that I'm going to present uh, is called an Early Career Prize. It's known as the RSE Patrick Neal Medal. Patrick Neal was a distinguished Scottish naturalist and fellow of the RSE. Must have been one of the early fellows, um, born in 1776, died in 1851. Born in Edinburgh, spent his life here and became head of the large printing firm Neal and Company. But he's perhaps better known because he developed an interest in horticulture, uh, well, botany and horticulture. Uh, he's indebted to Neil for, the, we are indebted to Neil for the West Princess Street Gardens. Uh, in 1820, that portion of the North Loch was drained and five acres of ground were laid out to his plans with 77,000 trees and shrubs. Must have been a big job supervising that. So the RSE Patrick Neal Medal goes to Dr. Robert Patrick Ryan of the University of Dundee, College of Life Sciences. He's in molecular microbiology. And it's awarded in recognition of his outstanding research work in the field of microbiology, particularly the translational aspects of his work to develop new biomarkers, diagnostics, and potential treatments for cystic fibrosis patients. Unfortunately, he can't be here this evening. So he has sent a couple of deputies and I'm delighted to welcome them. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Berta Holman and Shiki Ann, who are in the same lab as he is. And can I invite them to come forward and receive his medal, please? That is lovely. Do you want a cover for the box just to play safe? The other medal awarded this evening is sometimes referred to as the Senior Medal. It's the James Black Senior Prize. And it's going this evening to Professor Peter Kennedy, who is also our lecturer. James Black, 
Sir James Black, 1924 to 2010, was a Scottish doctor and pharmacologist. He established the physiology department in the University of Glasgow, and he is well known because he developed both beta blocker drugs and other drugs that block the effects of histamine on the stomach and heart with minimal toxicity. So that revolutionized therapy of the peptic ulcer. He was a fellow of the Royal Society of London, an honorary fellow here, and he got a Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1988, the Order of Merit in 2000, a knighthood in 1981, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Royal Medal in 2001. And I'm delighted to tell you that this year's recipient is very much of the same caliber. He's, Professor Peter Kennedy is awarded this medal for his outstanding contribution to the field of tropical medicine, in particular pioneering work on the human African trypanosomiasis. Is that <laughs> correctly? Not correctly, not totally correctly. We will hear it a bit in his talk otherwise known as sleeping sickness. I can manage that, and neurology. So Professor Kennedy has held the Burton Chair of Neurology at Glasgow University since 1987, and is an acknowledged and much admired, highly respected world leader in the investigation and treatment of infectious diseases of the nervous system. So he's made groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of both the human African trypanosomiasis, getting better, also known as sleeping sickness, <laughs> and of neurobiology. And he's played a major role in uh, establishing in this, the importance of this in the UK through his leadership. So, Professor Kennedy, can I ask you to come forward and receive the Sir James Black Medal? Thank you very much. And you have a protective box. Take care of it. <laughs> so the lecture that Professor Kennedy is about to give, its title is, it's got that word in it again. <laughs> <laughs> the Challenge of Human African Trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness in sub-Saharan Africa. So would you welcome Professor Kennedy to give his prize lecture. Dame Jocelyn, thank you very much indeed. That was a pretty good attempt, actually. <laughs> it gets better with practice. Yes. Um, First thing I'll do is I'll just take my wash off. In fact, someone said, how long does it last? I said, well, it's 45 minutes or the 50 minutes with the jokes. So, <laughs> so we'll keep the jokes in, but please, someone, it's quite a good watch, so do remind me to pick it up again. I've got this tendency to leave it behind. Fine. So this, uh, it's a real uh, privilege um, and a pleasure to, um, to be giving this talk, and in particular uh, uh, because of Sir James Black, for a reason which I'll give you in a moment. Uh, it's great to be uh, speaking to this audience. And uh, this talk is going to be in three parts. Uh, the first uh, part is going to be talking about the general aspect of human African trypanosomiasis uh, or sleeping sickness. If I'll call it sleeping sickness as well, it's easier. Um, and I'm going to talk about the epidemiology, the clinical features, the history. This is something that's going to be very um, easily, under easily understood uh, even by people who aren't familiar with, uh, with, with this disease. The second bit, the middle bit, is going to be much more hard science, if you will, about some of the work that's been going on in my laboratory um, uh, for the last uh, 20 years or so, but focusing on some recent uh, unpublished data. And the third bit really marries the first and the second because it's to talk about uh, the development of a new drug uh, formulation that we've developed, which has only come about because of the science, but has relevance to the first part, which is the, the human disease. Okay, so, so this is Sir James Black. Um, uh, I actually knew Sir James uh, quite well over, 
over a period of 10 years between 1991 and 2001. He was actually a mentor uh, of mine. And as well as being a brilliant um, uh, uh, scientist, he was, for those who knew him, he was actually a man of great modesty and a man of enormous personal kindness. Um, and he was extraordinarily nice to many, uh, as I was then, younger uh, uh, scientists. And um, he was very, very um, uh, an inspirational uh, person. So it's a particular honor for me to be giving this. Uh, so historical master, now hat, is human African trypanosomiasis, okay? But hat or Stevenson is just easy. Otherwise, this talk would be twice as long. <laughs> so there was an awareness of this disease in cattle and humans for centuries. Um, in fact, uh, uh, even a thousand years ago, in fact, the despotic emperor of Mali had this strange disease in which he was sleeping all the time and died. And this was known about for some time. And also, it was um, known that there was this disease in, uh, in cattle called Nagana, which was only occurring in sub-Saharan regions in particular latitudes, the fly sickness, and they would get pneumonia and they would die. But, it, but uh, at the last part of the 19th century was the key period for discovering the cause. Now, if you see anything in yellow, that's important. Okay? Everything else you can forget. Actually, if you want, you can forget the whole thing, but that's okay. Right. <laughs> so basically, this was... Uh, but uh, David Bruce in 1994. So David Bruce, now he was famous because he was a Scottish microbiologist now remember, I'm a Londoner, so I'm not being parochial here, but the Scottish uh, uh, contribution to tropical medicine is actually extraordinary, um, as, we'll, as we'll see. David Bruce was a Scottish microbiologist. He, desc he described brucellosis, which you've heard of, that you get from unpasteurized milk. Um, and he basically was sent out. He went to Zululand because there had been a major problem there. And he and his wife spent several years studying uh, how this disease came about. And basically, he identified tryponosomes. Tryponosomes are these single cells, protozoan parasites, which cause the disease. He found that, they were, that the blood of, in, of infected uh, uh, cattle had these. And he established that, health, that healthy game animals, wild animals, were the reservoirs of, the, of, uh, of these tryponosomes. And that, there was a tra uh, and that when the testy fly bit the, the animals in the wild, and then bit the, uh, the domestic animals. The domestic ones got, uh, got ill. So he basically showed this link between the wild animals, the domestic animals, the tryposome, and the tsetse fly. So he, he, that was his great uh, contribution. And then in 1899, uh, caused a parasite called tryposome brucei. And so everything is brucei, and that's named, uh, as you'd expect, after Bruce. Then in 1902, um, Everett Dutton from Liverpool identified a European patient a thing called uh, T. brucei gambiense, and of course, Gambia is on the West African side, so that's how you understand that. And then 903, Aldo Castellani, a very interesting man. He was a 24-year-old, very ambitious Florin, uh, a, a microbiologist from a famous Florentine family. And he uh, was sent out there with two others by the Royal Society's first commission on sleeping sickness to investigate um, uh, this outbreak that was occurring in Uganda. Now, in Uganda, Hundreds of thousands of people at the time were being wiped out by this disease. Absolutely disastrous. And what he did is he managed to identify uh, these protozoan parasites, these tryposomes, in the spinal fluid of a patient with sleeping sickness. This was the first demonstration that uh, this organism could be found in humans. Now, in fact, this was very controversial at the time. In fact, he initially thought that streptococci were important, and the Royal Society didn't actually publish his paper. But when, um, when Bruce was sent out there to help him, and then the two of them worked together, and they uh, got the result. I think it was felt that Bruce felt that maybe Castellani um, uh, uh, needed him uh, much more than he thought. And there was actually quite a controversy, which is still ongoing. Nevertheless, Castellani was, made this fundamental observation and he actually used centrifugation of the, of the spinal fluid. And then 910, Stephen Fanthorpe described TB rhodesiense in East African. Now, I can still remember um, when uh, Zimbabwe was a Rhodesia case. Okay, so of course, at that time, there was Northern Rhodesia, there was Rhodesia, and so that's, so that's easy to, 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 to remember. David Livingston, I'm always amazed how young he was when he died. I mean, to me, that's just nothing. You know, he died when he was 60. I mean, that's just like nothing these days, but 60. <laughs> Uh, says he. And, um, of course, uh, you'll know that he was, of course, a born in Blantyre, famous, uh, a great Scot, and he was uh, a doctor, missionary, um, a an African explorer. He, he walked 29,000 miles during his life. He discovered many, many uh, lakes and had four major 
uh, 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 trips in Africa, and of course an anti-slavery activist. Um, and he was interesting because he was the first person, believe it or not, to give arsenic for, uh, for trypanosomiasis. In fact, he describes in a paper, this was something like 1850, uh, I think 1858, and in it, in the British Medical Journal, he says, in 1847 or 1848, nowadays you'd be more precise than that, that uh, he had a very, very sick um, mare that got the fly disease, a certain attitudes were very, very sick, and he gave arsenic in the barley water, and the horse got better. And then the horse, which is great, his first use of arsenic, then the horse got worse again eventually, and then got worse, and then wanted to give him more, and then the arsenic has side effects, and so he says, the, the, he says that the, the horse looked at him in the eye and said, I'd rather, as if to say, I'd rather die of the disease than this doctor. Okay. Uh, and, and actually, you know, he's got a point, the horse had a point, uh, and in fact, as you'll see later, because things haven't really changed that much, and what I'm going to tell you about later on is how we think we've made, so how we have made uh, arsenic a bit safer. This was Castellani. I just love the moustache. Wonderful. Um, he was a very interesting man, you know, because um, he, he was actually Mussolini's doctor for 20 years, would you believe? Uh, but what was even more interesting, he's actually, if, I've read his autobiography. Apparently, he actually thought Mussolini was quite a good bloke, which, which is interesting, until later on when he thought he wasn't such a good bloke. Uh, he was also a personal doctor to exiled King Umberto, of, uh, and he was also knighted by the king, became a KCVO, so he was a very interesting character. Now, what has led to the re-emergence? The thing about sleeping sickness is that it goes up and down, depending on various factors. The socio-economic instability disrupts disease surveillance. You see, in sleeping sickness, the reservoirs for the, for the, uh, for the human disease, the Rodizienza is actually uh, cattle. The reservoirs for the West African type is, is humans. So what happens is that... Um, most, most, of the, most of, the, of the cases are, are, are actually uh, Gambienza, which is humans. So if you can isolate humans and treat them and have good vector control, control the tsetse fly that's, that's transmitting this disease, you can keep the disease down to a low level. So when you've got war, you, of course, you have the perfect situation where socioeconomic instability uh, 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 occurs and you can't isolate people, you can't get to them, you can't have vector control. Also, financial allocation problems, um, uh, drug resistance, and all these various factors can lead to new resurgences. Population movements are very important. For example, in Uganda, there are two areas that I go to. One is Kotoruro, the other is Soroti, and they have cattle markets. So when the animals go from one to another, they bring in different human uh, species because a cattle have got three animal to one human triplosome. So that's why um, it's very difficult to eradicate. So what happens there is that new epidemics have occurred in these regions because, uh, because of cattle markets, because of movement. That was work that was shown by Sue Wellborn um, uh, and uh, her colleagues in Edinburgh University, who's made many important uh, discoveries in this area. So what do they look like? Were well, they single cell parasites? That's what they, the beasts look like. Um, and the protozoans, they're flagellated, um, and that's how they move around. And, and the, thing, the thing about these things is you get a fluctuating... Parasitemia means... Any emia means in the blood. So the level goes up and down. Now, as I'll show you, basically they change their protein coats. So what happens is they you keep getting these waves due to antigenic variation, which is a very well-known phenomenon, whereby the organism es escapes, the, uh, uh, escapes your, control, uh, your efforts to control it. And of course, there's only one cell. Now, this is remarkable because this does so much damage. I mean, so how many cells have we got? Well, in the human brain, you've got a, what, 100 billion, that's the 10 to the 11th cells, uh, neurons. If it's, so that's a lot of cells. And, so, and yet, and then and each neuron has got hundreds of, you know, tens of thousands of synaptic connections. So immense complexity. But of course, here you've got this one uh, organism, and, and, and it does an enormous amount of damage. And as I say, it's. Uh, it's, it's a very, very efficient predator. This is the, the epidemiology. Now, if you look at the, those areas, this is roughly is, the, uh, is where the Rift Valley is between east and, east and west. And you can see that Gambienza is a chronic infection. Uh, patients are ill for months to years, and about 95% overall. Rhodesiense is a more acute disease, the one I study, about 5% of infections, but 18% of the total risk. This disease occurs in about 36 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, a total of 52 uh, countries altogether in Africa. 
and about 70 million people are, uh, are at risk, so you're always underestimating. And in Uganda, you've got both the Gambienzi and the Rodizienzi occurring in the same place, and they're about 150 kilometers apart. So Rodizienzi is going that way, the other one's staying the same. So when you get both together, you've got problems, okay? Uh, this, in fact, shows up and down. Um, in fact, uh, um, I sometimes look at this and I think that looks a bit like my publication rebel, you know, sort of a, you know, you know postdoc, get chair, and eventually manage to delegate, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> don't look it up, please. Uh, 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 so basically, early on, you can see that um, what happened is it was brought right down. This was because of the fact there was mass culling of animals and also draconian uh, deforestation was occurring, and it got right down to very low levels at that point. And then what happened is wars occurred and it made it much more frequent. Now it's now come right down again. But this has the ability to go up and down, uh, just like sleeping sickness. So for example, there were 300,000 in 1998, and it, it came down and less than 10,000. This is due to very impressive uh, interactions between um, the uh, World Health Organization and, government uh, and NGOs and Médecins Sans Frontières, all sorts of things. So basically they have worked very hard at that. Uh, and um, these are impressive, but of course there are unreported and undiagnosed cases. And in the, in the, in the DRC, uh, there were more than twice as many cases than the actual reported. So it's unquestionably come down, but th th there's also unquestionable that there are more cases than reported. It also does occur in uh, Europe and America, and about something like 10 per year. But notice in these places, most are Rodizienzi, which is this more aggressive type. Why? Because of the fact that we visit the game parks. That's why. And this, now the testy uh, uh, infestation. Now it's very difficult to see. You know, the, the animal and the human are interrelated. This is 11 million square kilometers. Look, that's a third of the whole of Africa, okay? And the world is not that much bigger, okay? So this, in fact, is, is, shows USA. And in fact, that's 9.6 million square kilometers. This is 10 million square kilometers. This is greater than the USA. And this is the Tetsi belt. You can see that in the north, uh, it's not affected. And also in, in South Africa, it's, it, it's not affected. And over the last 100 years, maybe the actual area that's affected by the Tetsi fly has not gone down by more than 10%. Animal triples and mice, this is very important. Now, we've already seen that there's a link between the two because the source of the human <coughs> organism is present in, the, in animals. So there's the, that link. At the same time, if an animal is infected, then you, it can't produce milk, and therefore the health economic in, uh, invol, uh, implications. And furthermore, if the human is involved, is affected, then they're not well enough to, to, to be pastoralists. So basically, you've got this interaction between the two. So it's important that even if you control the, the human, you have to control the animal. Now, uh, I'm now going to show you um, uh, let me see, uh, let me see, a little video. And hopefully, oh, yes, it's going to work. Very good. OK, good. So this, in fact, shows a, um, uh, a, a tsetse fly, which are actually quite big. And, and it's, uh, it's a blood sucking. Uh, uh, there are 31 different types of uh, tsetse fly, but only eight are economically important, and six transmit disease. And, what, and, and, the, and the blood suckers, what it does is it, is it, it infects, uh, and it puts things in, and it takes things out. So what happens is it takes this blood meal, you can see that, and it takes up these triposomes from an infected person, and as it gets through the gut, it becomes more infective, okay, right? And you are allowed to be sick, sorry. <laughs> and so what happens is that it has this blood meal, and so it takes in, and it also uh, it takes out. Only about 2 to 10% of flies are actually infected. And you've got about a 1 in 20 chance, roughly, of contracting sleeping sickness if you get infected, if you get bitten. Don't worry too much. The bite is very painful, I'm told. So then it gets into the blood, multiplies by binary fission, and it circulates about th uh, in the rhodesia for about three weeks, and then the white blood cells destroy it initially, but then it can change its coat. You can see it's changed its coat. So now it's got a different protein coat, and now it's immune. Uh, resistant because of the fact that antibodies made cannot uh, infect. And this shows it going into the peripheral, into the liver, the spleen, the lymph nodes, and in due course, it will get past the blood-brain barrier into the brain. And then once it's done that, it goes out, it goes off, and then it, as I say, it, it matures in the midgut, and it becomes maximally infective in the salivary glands. So when it bites you, that's when it's infected. So that is, so there's the human, and there's also the, um, the, uh, the, the animal cycle. This the genome, well, I, just, just to mention that this has got 10,000 genes. Now, you and I have got about 20 to 25,000 genes. So we've only got about twice as many genes, but we've got 
God knows how many cells, and they've only got one cell. And the point is that 10% of the genes encode this variant surface glycoprotein, a VSG, of which only one is expressed. Now, this determines the immune specificity. So what happens is you have get a vaccine against it, then it'll just change its coat, it'll change. So it's always one step ahead. It plays hide and seek with the immune response and invariably wins. You see the same antigen variation with malaria, with HIV, which is why you haven't got vaccination um, uh, scheduled, unfortunately. And this shows a tetty fly trap. Now, in fact, this, I took this in 1998, I think. Now, um, what well, I visited in Gurman. This is someone else took the picture. And I, always, I like wearing blue and black, uh, especially blue. And I found out the tetty flies are very attracted to blue. This is the fly trap. What happens is this is impregnated with insecticide. This is ox's breath. Now, they are incredibly attracted to ox's breath. In fact, their attraction to ox's breath is even greater than my attraction to 90% lint chocolate, and that's saying something. And they absolutely love this stuff. And they're attracted. What happens is, the, is that they die because they love that, and they get the insecticide, and they go off and they die from heat exhaustion. And about, one of the, about four of these every square kilometer can provide good control in certain areas of uh, control. Now, one of the problems when I go to Africa, I've been 25 times to the field, is road accidents, okay? And I think, you know, you can, this is one of the reasons, and you can see that, if I, I almost got, got killed once. The other big problem I've got, actually, where I go, I've never had malaria. I've never been bitten by a testy fly, by the way, which shows one of two things. Either one, I've been lucky, or two, they have no taste. <laughs> I'd like to feel it's the latter, but I'd be fooling myself, wouldn't I? Um, and the other problem, actually, is the more serious, about one in five times I get dreadful, I get, you know, I get bad GI infections. But then I started not to go to this particular restaurant, and then I, <laughs> and then basically I stopped getting sick, right? The other thing is you need a certain amount of courage when you go into the field. So if you want courage, don't eat those bananas. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because they're not going to help you. <laughs> So we come, on to the, um, we come on to the early stage one and stage two. The early are hemolymphatic. What happens is that you get this trypsome chakra, this, in, uh, this infection. In the, west, west, in the Gambian, which is in the riverine areas, it's often on the buttocks because as people lie bend down for their fishing, they get bitten. And early, non-specific headache malaise, they just feel awful, hepatosplenomegaly, and they just feel generally non-specifically ill. And then the late stage is when the parasites have crossed the blood-brain barrier. And that's when they get very, very sleepy, irritability, lack of concentration. And they get virtually every conceivable neurological sign you can imagine. It reminds me of HIV. It gets to the parts of the nervous system that other parts you know, can't reach. It gets virtually anything can be produced. And this occurs because in Gambienzi form, this can take a year. In Rodizienzi, about three weeks. And so these are the things that you get. I mean, basically virtually anything. But notice how nonspecific. Early hemolymphatic, as I say, important is in yellow, late encephalitic. Um, and that's just what I've said. And they can merge into each other. You cannot say which is which based on the clinical picture. Only the CSF will show you. In fact, my colleague Jerry Sternberg and I recently produced a paper showing that even in the early stage patients in Malawi and, and also in Uganda, they in fact had what you would call neurological symptoms, neurological features. So you can't necessarily assume. And that may have a an, anim an experimental correlate, which I can mention to you. And so you can't definitely say which is which. Now, what I should tell you is untreated, this disease is invariably fatal. Okay? If you don't treat, you die. Okay? Now, there aren't many things that do that. Uh, things that come to mind immediately are, let's sort of think, um, well, uh, 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 kreutzberg jakob disease will certainly kill you, almost always. The old days, HIV, I was around you know, looking after HIV patients before heart king. That would almost certainly kill you. Um, even, you know, Lassa fever, you know, will maybe kill 30%. Uh, Ebola, maybe 50 to 90%. Certain snake bites will kill you for sure. A pneumonic, probably not bubonic plague will kill you. But, you know, there aren't that many things that actually do you in. Uh, this will. Now, they get the sleep disturbances. Basically, they become narcoleptic, which means, you know, they keep falling asleep. Daytime is, is, is uh, they're sleepy and at night. I sometimes joke that, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, narcolepsy is when the audience falls asleep when the lecture is interesting. You know, it's interesting. Uh, no one has narcolepsy here. Yeah. And basically, uh, there's evidence for alteration of sleep structure. So what happens, Adam Bouguet had shown, from Belgium had shown, that whereas you and I have five episodes of REM sleep, rapid eye movement, during which we dream, about five nights, right, 
they had this at the onset. We have it at, after about an hour and a half each time. So the structure has changed, and this can be used diagnostically. And this actually shows they really do get sleep disorders. This is, in fact, the biggest ever study. This, in fact, shows 75% do get sleep disorder, as I mentioned. And they get these other things, motor weakness, behavior, gait disturbance, all of these things, extraordinary abnormal movements. I remember speaking to someone who produced a, a, a documentary about this. And she was saying, it's funny, all these patients that were doing that had these very strange movements. And I said, oh, look, I recognize that. You know, that's career form. That's, that, you know, I, know, I know what that is. So they get all these strange movements. So it can get to any part. This, in fact, shows the scan of a, an MRI scan of a 13-year-old patient, a patient of Dr. George Atagir, who's a colleague of mine from Lisbon. This, in fact, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, MRI scans, um, but put it this way, no one here wants to have an MRI scan like that. If anyone does, they better see me afterwards, but, <laughs> because you don't want this. And basically what this is, is, is looking um, at uh, the ventricles, uh, and these shouldn't be that big. Uh, and this is, this is a child who has multiple effects, and also these abnormalities are abnormal. This is not actually the typical one, but this is, you know, of course, this is done in patients who come to Europe or America, having been there. Uh, you, you know, you don't, in some of the hospitals I go to, you don't even have chest x-rays, so I mean, x-rays. So, you, you know, this is not in the field. Now, now I'm now going to just, to just show you where I, now, the, now the four areas, in fact, that is um, uh, uh, Sudan, uh, Uganda, the DRC, and Angola. That's the hot areas. These are the areas where there have been wars, so that's not really surprising. And notice, you look at the, uh, the, the areas above, you know, Egypt, although it doesn't happen, Madagascar doesn't happen, South Africa doesn't happen. So basically, it occurs in, the, in that sub-Saharan belt. That's where I go. And in fact, this is a picture actually taken by uh, my mentor uh, and uh, colleague, friend, Max Murray, took something in 1960, <laughs> showing a child with it. But this also shows in the, um, in fact, you can get malaria as well as uh, sleep. This is actually a child who actually had a, a reaction to the intravenous malarsoprol that was given to treat the brain disease and had this dreadful post-treatment reaction to encephalopathy, which I'll tell you about, and also had malaria at the same time, but recovered. This is the early stage where you can see that the face is swollen, and this is guys doing lung puncture. This is a village, Lupi, where I used to go to, in, um, which is just on the border with Uganda, and this is the village, and um, this was actually a very nice village, uh, but interesting, 17 out of 400 suffered. Just outside the village, there was this sort of uh, tree, the shrubbery, bush, and it was full of seti flies. So to get to, to water, to get to the water, they had to go past that. So if you dug a well in the middle of the, of the village, that would obviate the need to actually, actually go. So that would have reduced. And there was this project called FITCA, which were farming in seti controlled uh, areas, in fact, which was about that kind of thing. And so this was, and that actually is, uh, looks about two, is about five, actually, because of... Uh, of um, uh, massively delayed milestones that you get as a, as a kid. This is the Glasgow Coma score, with which I hope you are familiar. This was devised by um, Graham, now Sir Graham Teasdale, who was uh, my, my opposite number in neurosurgery for, for many, many years. He's retired now, and Brian Jeanette put this together. This is, you know, the, the, this is the famous GCS that's used, and we use this, and it's very, very effective because it can be done very easily. And, and so we can look at various things in the spinal fluid and the blood and correlate it with this. And also, we'd, we, we modified it and added all the bits and pieces. So even a, uh, a, a non-medical person, but a fully trained uh, health professional can manage to get this data down. And that's what we use. The simpler, the better. How do you diagnose it? Uh, direct demonstration of the parasites, the best bet. Antibody uh, for, usually for the, um, for the Rhodesiense. Antibody detection for the Gambiense. So the thing is, in the Rhodesiense, which is this very, very aggressive type, you've got high level of the parasites all the time. The parasites are there. So you can see them. That's how you diagnose. But with the Gambiense, there's a greater adaptation of the parasite to the host, probably because of, 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 um, of uh, evolutionary reasons that we can't, haven't got time to go into. And uh, as a result, it, it's a cyclical uh, parasitema. You might miss it. So there you're looking at serological methods, which means you look at antibodies to look for antigens which are expressed. Typical results, uh, spinal fluid uh, is, is raised, slightly nonspecific, uh, increased protein, very difficult to see triplosomes. If you see them, you have a diagnosis, difficult. Now, diagnosis can be difficult because they often have malaria. So basically, you, you know, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes basically to realize you've got the disease if it's in an area that is in, uh, where, where sleeping sickness is endemic. And, but that's important, and that's a parasite, that's just what I've told you. This this called card agglutination 
triplomyosis test. Uh, the problem about that is that you get non-specific positives. It can be difficult. Only really good if the incidence is high. And you always need to look at the spinal fluid, because that's how you diagnose late, uh, late stage, after, after, because of the cell count. Therefore, you don't know what patient's affected. Posh tests like CSF, PCR, this clever stuff, proteomics, is great. In the field, it is not very practical, frankly. Uh, and the IgM is also important. Now, the, cri the WHO criteria are five, more than five white cells. Normal is zero. None of us, hopefully, has anything. More than five is not normal. The problem is that um, you can have less than five and have the disease, and between five and 20 and not have the disease. So in some areas, in the West, Western areas, they've used 20. So basically, and some of these patients have been treated with early stage uh, drugs. So this, this is a very controversial area. There's no consensus. Here's the problem, the fundamental problem. If you get this wrong and you don't treat late stage disease, the patient's gonna die, okay? Now the late stage disease drugs, as I'll show you, are more, much more toxic than the early stage. But if you get it wrong the other way and you treat early stage erroneously with late stage, then you've got an 8% risk of killing the patient. This drug in Osprol kills about 8% of patients. Everyone dies, 8%, and it's the only treatment that works for the Rhodesiense also uh, works with, um, with uh, the other type. So there's a lack of 100% congruence between the di biological definition of CNS disease and the ground for a therapeutic choice. These are two aspects which should be linked, but they're not. Okay? So no one agrees what constitutes brain disease, and also no one agrees when you should treat. That's a problem. Maybe I suggested uh, about 10 years ago, there may be an intermediate stage uh, whereby trips, the sleeping sickness, bugs can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is between the blood and the brain, just gets through it, but doesn't spread. And maybe at that point, you can still get them with early stage drugs. And evidence seems to be that that is the case. Now, everything changes. Just to contradict myself, recently there's been, there are a few patients who don't die, okay? There are a few patients who became asymptomatic, aparasitemic. They refused treatment, and they were fine. Or they were treated, and they were fine. They're, if you will, resistant. And there are a few that have still got antibodies are tolerant. And are these patients infected? We don't really know. So therefore, um, this is an important modern concept. In animals, there is something called trypanotolerance. tolerance. In fact, there's even a trypanotolerance tolerance center in Gambia because some species of uh, animal species, such as the endama and the West African shorthorn, are able to control the anemia and also to control the parasitemia. Okay. So there are the, so na Africa has these natural genetic resources. The drugs, uh, none of these drugs would have passed uh, muster right now. If they came right now, the, the FDA, EMA would say, you must be joking, you're not going to use that. But of course, look at, the year, look at the years. This is, reflects many, many years of lack of pharmaceutical investment. Why? Because the drugs have to be given free. No, they, 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 the rural poor can't afford these. So that, therefore, it, you know, they can't recoup their, uh, all the money that, that is involved in, in, in making these new drugs. And you can see, basically, that the melasoprol in 49, this arsenical, remember first given in 1848 by Livingston, is given for both types. More recently, this DFMA eflornithine and this drug has been given a combination therapy, and this is effective for the gambiense type, although actually it's still killed, you know, 1%. So if I said to you, by the way, this drug, you've got 100 chance of dying, you know, you look at me as it's crazy, you know, uh, but nevertheless, you know, the alternative. And the Gates Foundation, in fact, had, this spent $30 million on this new oral drug, failed at phase three, which was a shame. So, Suramin is intravenous, Rodizienze, pentamidine. Early stage, these aren't too bad, these drugs. They're not good, they're not too bad. Have to be given parenterally, and late stage, melosoprol uh, for the, for the Rodizienze, and that's why I'm interested. And, of course, if you've got someone who's got both types in your brain, right? So, in Uganda, if you've got both Gambiense and Rodizienze, the only drug that's going to cure that right now would be, would be monosoprol. Follow-up, you have to follow patients at the end, six monthly laboratory evaluations. Some of the needles that are, that are used, in fact, are metal and they get blunt, so people don't like having loads of lump punctures. And severe sequelae, cognitive, all sorts of, you know, everything you can imagine, epilepsy, and um, basically uh, uh, the, both following treatment without, uh, and anyway, these patients get very, very sick. So the sequelae are very severe. And there are some new drugs in the pipeline, orofex and idazole, just completed phase two, and we're hearing, you know, hopefully it'll work, but we don't know yet. This drug uh, has just 
completed phase one trial. And this stuff, which I'm going to tell you about, is what my lab's been doing. This is using a, a different uh, uh, concept, and I'll show you about that. OK, and also, th this is this PTRE, which is this encephal encephalopathy. This occurs in about 10% of cases, fatal up to 50%. But in recent studies of the short, of the short course of, uh, of Monospiral in the Rodizienze, the death rate was 8%. And this basically, no one quite knows what the cause is, but it looks like the kind of thing that, for example, children get um, after exanthematur, after measles, mumps, these things. They get a, it's called an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And they get these characteristic pathology. Uh, that, that, that this shows astrocytes, which are these star-shaped cell, cells. These are the so-called MOT cells, which is plasma cells stuffed with IgM, a dying neuron, and fibroid necrosis. This shows that Hume Adams was actually, there's only one ever post-mortem study done, one ever. 86, done in Glasgow by Professor Hume Adams, if I remember well, and this shows just how serious it could be. Now, what causes this? We come on to the second part, which I'll go rapidly go through. We don't quite know what causes this, but number one, for my money, is most likely. Because in the field, I said to these people, you know, what do you do when you treat the patient? You know, the patients get sick, you know, like that kid I showed. And they give, you give steroids and you give anticonvulsants. Oh, we retreat. I said, what do you mean you retreat? Oh, we have to continue. And they don't get it a second time, the, the reaction. That's telling me that this is not going on. Because if that was going on, then this would happen each time. So I think clinical observation can actually inform and similarly, this looks to me like a rapid, you're killing all the parasites because you're putting in this intravenous drug. It gets to the brain, and all these parasites are dying. You get a storm of horrible things coming out, cytokines, and that's why you die. That's what I think. And there's, there are these other factors. At this stage, we have to use the mouse, okay? We have to use for the mouse. Uh, as you say, we have great respect for our mice, as you can see. Um, and we use, that's not the mouse's name, by the way. That's my name, okay? <laughs> The mouse is called Malcolm, if you have to know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have great respect, because if you don't respect them, they'll run rings around you. A mouse QC, you do not want to, want to meet this guy in court. He'll absolutely kill you, I can tell you. Um, so basically, what we have is this established mouse model by uh, Frank Jennings, who was, recent, who was a, the unsung hero of trypanosomiasis, who died recently, and Barbara Bradley, who's in our lab right now. She's a fantastic uh, technician. Basically, they got this model, developed it, and you can model all the, the stages of the sleeping sickness, and uh, it's reproducible. This is the most commonly used model worldwide. This is what they use. Okay. So basically, this is uh, what happens is you inject the parasites into the mice, and intraperitoneally, and you wait. And then you treat with a drug that's subcurative. So what happens is the parasites are cleared from the, perif from the, vas from the periphery, but not the brain. And you can overshoot in the brain. Second drug, the brain, they're really shaking now, and the, and the mice develop. This brain inflammation, it looks the same as sleeping sickness. This is a model absolutely reproducible. And so the sort of thing that you can look through, I will very quickly go through this section because this is some scientific work which I'd like to tell you about. Basically, you can look at the parasite load, which means how many parasites in the brain, which you do in because you look at their molecular, you look at their DNA, basically, the severity of the reaction and the function of the blood brain barrier. So, for example, this is the stage one. They proliferate, as I've told you about, and that's stage two. The definition of a stage two, experimentally, is when the stage uh, one drugs no longer cure the disease. Okay? So this is stage two. So we can do this. And then what happens is this is the scientists amongst you will be very familiar with this. What happens is you get the brains, you extract DNA. This looks complicated. It's not. Um, I mean, even I can do it, which is saying something. And basically, you can do what's called quantitative PCR, which you may have heard of, which is a clever little technique in which you look at um, the DNA. So you can look at the, the, the load. And this looks, for example, at the load in the brain. And once you've infected, what happens is at 14 days, it becomes significant. So at between 14 and 21 days, things happen. And how interesting that at 21 days is when we know that the parasites pass the blood-brain barrier. Similarly, we can look at pathology. Now, you can take it from me. This is, you've probably never seen meningitis before. That's what it looks like. Okay, that's the meninges. And you can see uninfected. Uh, we always say three quarters of all, our, of all our experiments are controls to, to make sure we're not fooling ourselves. And this shows the it, it cuffing, which is the perivascular cuffing, which is an inflammatory response. And basically, this is what you see. And so we developed, um, I mean, Lord Kelvin said, you, if you can't quantitate it, you don't know very much about it. So we developed a quantitative grading scale both for the pathology and also for the clinical. We did this, and this, is, this works, because you can then do statistics. 
And so basically, the neuropathology also at 14 days becomes significant. In other words, and again, uh, you can see it goes right up at 21 days. Now, the other thing about the blood-brain barrier, the blood-brain barrier is a barrier between the blood vessels and the brain, extremely important, because if you can somehow modify that passage, then you've got some hold on the disease. Basically, interestingly, um, when people look at models of blood-brain barrier, they don't find any electrical changes. Similarly, you look at the proteins of the blood-brain barrier, you don't see any damage. However, if you put a dye in the jugular vein, you do see damage that occurs. And how can you do this? You can look at this using MRI. MRI you'll be familiar with because it's used in clinical practice. As a neurologist, we use it all the time. And so basically, as you know, contrasts don't readily cross the intact blood-brain barrier. But if you've had a stroke, they certainly will. And basically, they contra and this is a classic patient with a stroke. So I mean, this is just routine bread and butter. So I had this idea some time ago. In Glasgow, they've got this 70, very powerful, small-bore MRI in which it's useful for small animals. And it's very powerful. So we put the animals in, and it works in trypsomyces. So you can actually look at this. And basically, these clever physicists, I mean, I couldn't do this, but they basically work out a signal change. They then can, this is Barbara, as you can see, in the thing. In fact, you don't want to put any metal in there, because, like a key or a knife, because it travels like 40 miles an hour, very dangerous. And uh, basically, you do various scans and various modes of, uh, of um, the physicists amongst you will, will understand this. It's uh, inversion recovery, and etc. This is a classic MRI. And you can look at the blood-brain barrier. And you can look at structures. And what they can do is they can look at altered colors, which means if it's, there's leakage, then in fact you see colors like that. And if there's not leakage, you don't. So what happens is they can quantify the leakage. And again, it becomes significant in terms of signal change at that point. So at 14 to 21 days, that's when things happen. And this then shows that you can correlate what you see with the anatomy. And basically, you see it mainly amongst the holes within the brain, the ventricles. But also, you see it in certain other areas. Um, for, for those that are interested, the area of the brain that's involved in sleeping sickness is the hypothalamus, the suprachiasmatic nuclei. They generate circadian rhythm our body rhythms, and how interesting that these patients have problems with body rhythms. That's why. So basically, we've seen an increase in the parasite load at 14 days. The inflammatory response is increased uh, at four days before the establishment of CNS disease. Something happens before the disease is established. And this is when we see cytokines and immune things infected. Here we have uh, in, in fact, blood brain marrow dis uh, uh, dysfunction. And again, it occurs. So there's a correlation between those three parameters. And these are terribly useful, because we can use them. Now, this just shows some of the things that we've done. Uh, we've looked at various um, uh, chemicals to see the effect. The principle is you add an antagonist to something. And if that improves the animal, it's telling you that that thing that you've made an antagonist to is important. For example, there's a thing called substance P, which is a peptide protein in the brain. If you add an antagonist as anti that and the animal is a bit better, it's telling you that that substance that you've attacked is actually important in generating the response. And then, you've got, and then you can look at a clinical correlate of that. So therefore, it's told you about the pathology, pathogenesis. It's also told you about what you might do to, to treat. And this is a nice story. I have to tell you this, DFMO. This basically it became an orphan drug, okay, which means it's under 1 in 200,000 that it was useful for. Basically, it was very expensive. And then WHO, together with M. Sans Frontier, and the of these people got together, and they made 60 million doses free. This was present in a, a thing that was made by, I think, Bristol Myers. It was Vaniqua, which was a facial hair remover. It was, it was used. And it was, that was DFMO. And so they made it available. One of the reasons why MSF actually got the Nobel Prize for Peace was because of this. So this is now used as, uh, for Gambienzi. Although well, it's a major advance, but it still has side effects, and it takes a lot of uh, fluid. So DFMO can both uh, prevent, ameliorate, in other words, an existing one. In other words, you give it uh, before and afterwards. So this basically shows, can you see the meningitis? You see that? You see these cuffs? Horrible. Shouldn't be there. You see these astrocytes? And then you give this drug, and everything is better, all is better. So it's not surprising it's also good in patients. This shows, uh, I just, this was with, uh, Susan Lehman is one of the great uh, American uh, uh, pharmacologists, and we were at NIH together as faculty scholars a long time ago. And she said, you know, can we try this, in, this antagonist in your system? We published this paper, and we actually found that her antagonist, Rome Poulenc, basically decreased 
the, um, the inflammatory response. So this told us, in fact, that neuropeptide, this neuropeptide was important in generating the inflammatory response. And this has also been shown to be important in malaria, HIV, and other things. And also the inflammatory astrocyte proliferation was also reduced. This is a bit of fancy stuff. This is a, uh, knockouts. If you want to look at the function of a gene, you can modify the embryo such that you take out a gene. So it's called a knockout. So you, you take a gene out. And so if it's, and you see what the phenotype. So you think something's important, take the gene out, there should be an effect. And this basically shows that the clinical grading score was reduced when this gene for substance P was knocked out. Again, showing it was important. I want to show you very briefly some recent unpublished data. We've used microarray study, um, which, in which you look at the entire genome in one go, uh, in, in sleeping sickness. And what we found is that we've, we, we've determined which genes uh, are upregulated or downregulated using this pathway which is a group of genes which are functionally uh, constructed, functionally considered. And this, basic, this is the basic, all you've, got, all you've got to show here, is look, look at the red. The red, these things are genes which are controlled with blood-brain barrier function. These are the blood-brain barrier. These are upregulated, in other words, they're turned on early on, but once you get to 14 days, 21, they're no longer important, right? But as you go along, the, these guys, which are the antigen processing, the immune ones, become important. So we've managed to map the downregulation of the, uh, the blood-brain barrier genes and the upregulation of the, of the other things, for example, cell adhesion molecules, all kinds of things, which fits. And this is a bit easier to, understand, to see. Here we've actually quantitated. And again, 14 days seems to be the point at which you go from this upregulation of... Uh, the blood-brain barrier genes to, to, to the um, immune-mediated ones, and, you can, and that really fits in. This, in fact, simply shows that, uh, just to show that we have, have been quite busy in the lab, that, that TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and IL-1, these are the cytokines, these small molecules which can make other molecules proliferate, very important in the immune system. These have, um, are, are increased, and these are the nasty ones. There are also some good ones, something called IL-10, which is counter-inflammatory. This, in fact, shows chemokines, which are controlled with, 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 um, uh, with uh, attraction of, uh, of molecules. And here, this CXCL10 seems to be the one that's terribly important. This seems to be involved in driving the, 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 uh, the inflammatory response. And also, but everything basically goes up, okay? And it's just to show that we've actually been quite busy. Now, again, you can take the gene out of this. You can take, um, for example, the knockouts. For example, if you take, I've said to you, for example, just, just to show you the approach that we use, the 6CL10 is this chemokine. This appears to be important in driving the inflammatory response. If you take out that gene in a knockout, the, everything should be better, right? Now, this, in fact, shows that it's, not the, it's exactly the same. This is the knockout, um, and that's the, uh, the wild type, which is not, uh, not, we've got the gene intact. There's no difference. Okay, you might well say, but this is even more remarkable. You have to take my word, this is remarkable, because if you look at the, um, this is the knockout, okay, and actually this has knocked out the bad stuff, so therefore this should be the other way around. In other words, this is completely the opposite to what you'd expect. Now, the experiment, you have to take my word for it, was done carefully. So there are two ways of looking at this. I look at this and I get excited because it's something which I wasn't expecting. So in other words, what it's showing is that it's not what you think. Either this was not as important, or there's redundancy, something else has come in to be important, or that in some way knocking out that pro-inflammatory factor has induced something else. So to me, this is very exciting. Because it's the phenotype. What we see has opened up new possibilities and gives, allows us to look into it in more detail. We know more about it in its complexity. So this is a simple version, okay, <laughs> uh, which I <laughs> published in the journal Clinical Investigation. Basically, all you want to know is three things, okay? There is what happens in the blood, which is all these compl complicated things, uh, complicated things that happen from the triplosome. It has all these effects on macrophages, these phagocytic cells. They produce horrible things which act on the brain. You've then got the direct effect of the triplosome on the brain, and that affects, as I mentioned, the hypothalamus. You look at immune alterations and you see them there. And you've also got this complex interplay between these pro-inflammatory cytokines, these horrible things, and the IL-10, again, these are in red, which is counter-inflammatory. And the influence, that influences the brain. So you've got all these factors which are acting on the brain and all these points at which you can do something, okay? The last five minutes or so, yeah, we have about eight, ten, ten minutes left. I'm now going to tell you about some recent stuff which marries what I showed you in the beginning with what I've just showed you. I've just showed you the hard science, if you will. But this is um, what we're This is a picture of Glasgow University. This is unusual. 
Anyone know why? Well, there's, there's blue sky, okay? You notice that, yes. <laughs> this happens three times a year, so, you know. So we got lucky here, okay, right? Now, this, of course, is Sir James Black, okay? And um, he said the most fruitful basis for the discovery of a new drug is to start with an old drug. That's what we did. In fact, I could just imagine him saying to me, you know, the other thing he used to say to me is, Peter says, no bacon slicing, right? No bacon slicing, right? What he meant by that is don't publish little tiny papers, you know. Publish a few big ones, you know. I mean, I should publish some big ones, but anyway. But, uh, and in fact, uh, and he did that, you know. He produced a few papers, which was unbelievable. So basically, so what we did is we started, minoxidil is extremely toxic, so we thought, let's start off with that. And that's what he did, with basically with, with beta blockers and with, H, and with antagonists. He looked at the, all the effects that, that, that were produced with his antagonists, saw new effects, and then got antagonists. That's just what he did. Um, so if it works for him. <laughs> so basically, this shows melosoprol. Now, why is it so awful? It's awful because of the fact that it's got low water solubility. It's not soluble in water. Therefore, you have to give it in propylene glycol, right, which is extremely toxic, horrible. Yes, exactly. And so you give this, and it is incredibly painful. This, you do not want to see this given, okay, uh, because you can hear this. A.A. Gill uh, wrote a thing that, you know, the, the, the eminent columnist uh, wrote, uh, when he saw this in, I think, 2000, he wrote in Sunday Times, the patient said, it's like having chili peppers injected into your heart, apparently. That's if you're lucky, okay? And it's terrible. People that held that, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. And also you get phlebitis, thrombophobitis, necrosis. And also, well, this is given, some, this arsenic is given in horses and animals, you know. There are at least six different animals that get ne neurological problems. And, you know, there you get gangrene, and you can get gangrene. I mean, it's absolutely <coughs> terrible, awful. So basically, what we did... Well, like it, what our colleague Stefan Gibo did in, in Lorraine, he basically produced a, a, a psychodextrin molecule. So basically what, what happened is psychodextrins are these naturally occurring molecules, oligosaccharides. What they, they use very widely in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, peroxicam is, is, is a psychodextrin. These internally are hydrophobic, but outside they're water-soluble. And it's got room for guest molecules, which you put in the middle. And therefore, they become, if they're intravenously effective, they become orally effective. Or if they're orally effective, they became up to 7,000 times more orally effective. This is what you do. You add the two together. You have two different types. Don't worry about that. And you can see, and it's quite easy to make these things. And so we then asked the question, are these toxic or not in our system? So I've introduced you already to these four methodologies. Now I'll show you how they worked. There's the straightforward, just seeing if they're cured. There's the tripsome load, the methodology, and the blood-brain barrier. All things that we've discussed, okay? So basically, if we look at the load, this shows what happens. This is the, the relapse rate. You, that means no cure, no cure, cure, okay? And that is the cure rate. In other words, a minimum curative dose. These are controls, okay? Always 75% are always controls to make sure we're not deceiving ourselves. Now, if you look at that dose, you convert that to a human dose. And remarkably, almost biblically, you come to a dose that's almost exactly the same as the dose that's of, of monospor that's given to patients. That is kind of handy, if you think about it, for, right? And then they're highly effective following oral administration. Then looked at um, the, the load, and basically it clears within four days. It goes right down. It clears the parasite load. This, is, this one is a little bit better, so we use this type rather than that type. Rapid clearance. Then looked at pathology. I've told you, you know, there's a meningitis. You can see that, okay? And then therapy, it's gone. The, the meningitis is gone. These guys are gone. It's better. We use the grading scale to quantify with, with, with our colleague, well, who's recently died. George Gettenby was a wonderful um, uh, statistician from Strathclyde who helped us develop these technologies. He died tragically young recently. But he helped us with this. And basically, the score goes down very quickly. And furthermore, we looked at the blood brain barrier. And again, using this imaging, and basically, again, this can be quantitated by our physics colleagues next door. And again, within 24 hours, the leakage has got better. So at the same time, rapid restoration of blood-brain uh, function. The animals didn't lose weight, which is the usual thing that happens when you're infected. Um, animals, you know, not seeing their lawyers, you know, that they're fine. And basically, they're these complexes are effective when delivered orally, rapidly clear triplosomes from the brain. They reduce the CNS inflammatory response, restore blood-brain barrier integrity, no overt signs of, of toxicity. So an oral formulation, Obviate the need for hospitalization, reduce treatment costs, reduce the pain, patient compliance. My colleagues that I got really quite close to in Uganda were so actually some patients in, in the villages, you know, 
they won't come to the doctor because they know full well they come to the doctor, you know, their treatment's going to kill them, okay? which, is, which is, could be right. So they don't go for therapy, and also it's known to be very painful. So where are we? Okay. Establish European Medicine Agency. I mean, there are bosses. Okay, they're the ones that determine. And also the, the FDA. Both have given orphan drug designation uh, for this drug. That's been achieved by, for, for, with both organizations, which means orphan drug means that it's it was based on the number of cases and, uh, that are affected, but the, the various reasons. It's a very good thing to have. Uh, um, they've uh, last March, they uh, last February, they approved up the protocol which I put together. Um, extremely rigorous, massively rigorous process. Interviews. I mean, they are very, very strict. Many safety, but they have finally approved it, and they, they've agreed that we can miss out phase one, go direct to a phase two, which is remarkable, um, and um, which is great. Um, and, uh, and identify a uh, company. We've, we've done that. Okay, we've got the company to do it. The funding, uh, the, the £2.5 million, pounds, we're still working on that one. Okay, but we can, as soon as we get it, we can start tomorrow. Trial protocol, done. Trial sponsor, done. The Uganda National Health Research Organization, as a director, has, will do that. Ethical approval will not be a problem because they basically go with the, with the, with the EMA or the FDA. Initial study, 20 oral versus 20 IV using the 10-day bridge molasper regime, so it's the same. And if this is successful, under Article 58, a phase two can then lead to this being put on the essential medicines li list and used in Africa, so within two or three, this could be used. Uh, to use in America and Europe, you have to do a phase three study. But the MHRA, you know, Medicine Health Regulation, have already told me that, uh, that it can be given um, on off-license on compassionate grounds to anyone who comes in the UK. Uh, that's a good deal. The bad news is I have to look after them, <laughs> but that's okay. So uh, as long as I take the rap. I want to thank the people that are involved in this. Um, of course, we've had armies of people involved in this, um, uh, including uh, 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 you know, people who are uh, well known to the society. Basically, but, but, but the key people have been, um, uh, Gene Rogers is the uh, initially technician, PhD student, now senior scientist, who's very much involved in the animal model. Uh, Barbara Bradley, of course, is, is, is a brilliant uh, animal uh, uh, technician who has been with us all this time. Amy Jones was a, a superlative uh, PhD student involved in this work, is now working in America. Paul Montague um, is a molecular biologist who did all the array stuff. Uh, we couldn't do this without the Experimental MRI Center. Um, obviously, the veterinary diagnostic studies uh, uh, services are good. University of Lorraine, Stefan Gibbo was involved in the, in, in the complexes. Uh, United, uh, Uganda National Health Research Organization, Sam is the director of that, it's been fantastic. Then Charles Wambogo and, Wambogo and Abbas Kakembo, my two colleagues who are in the Steeping Snake Control Program in Uganda, they are absolutely behind us and this wonderful colleagues. Uh, these people have been involved in the array studies, they gave the, the, the video. Uh, Jerry Sternberg, it, my first 10 years in Africa, I've been 25 times now to Africa, was with Joseph Ndungu, who by the way is a corresponding fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, as my privileged to introduce him about a year ago. But the last 10 years was my colleague Jerry Sternberg from Aberdeen, because he's very interested in diagnostics. And Max Murray's in gold, because he's, in, he's golden, and he's my mentor, friend, colleague. We started this together. Uh, without him, I would never have been in this area. And um, he can't be with us today, but he's with us in spirit. And these are the people that have uh, funded us. And I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, I'll stand, I'll stand up, yes. Yeah. So we have opportunity now for some questions. Uh, it would be helpful if you could use the microphone when you have a question. So if you raise a hand or otherwise catch my eye, I'll get a microphone to you. So have we questions? Yes, here, centre, near the front. Could you possibly explain why one form of the sleeping sickness is more potent than the other? More, more, more potent? Yes. Yes. Um, the, the Rhodesiense uh, has something called the SRA gene. The SRA gene codes for a protein that uh, is resistant to the triplytic factor, which is the natural lytic factor that destroys triplosomes. Okay. Um, theref uh, and uh, therefore, those, uh, therefore, the triplosomes are more powerful because they've got this, this gene. 
Whereas the Gambiens, they don't have it. As a result, it's much more aggressive because the fact that it's able to, to, to inactivate the triplytic factor, which is a, which a beta like protein. That's the main reason. Thank you. Mm. And a few rows further back near your aisle. Peter, in, in the wild animals, which act as uh, hosts, res host reservoirs, does the VSG system work? And I, I just wondered why these animals weren't getting ill. The, the wild animals, uh, interesting, you know, don't get, I mean, they don't, as you said, they don't get uh, so ill. No one really knows, but of course, some of those will be triple tolerant, of course, because of their superior immune systems. Um, why it affects the, uh, I mean, it's a great question. It's, it's Tony. Yeah, 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 Tony. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it, it obviously, you know, it's not known. It's, it's more phenomenology. One presume it does work in both systems. I think the reason why the domestic ones get iller is maybe just because of the fact that, uh, you know, maybe they've not been around for so long. Their, their immune systems have been, have been had less time perhaps to adapt. It's not really well known. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Great question. And next to Thank you. In the world of leprosy, there's a, a sort of agreement that there's a rollover every so, so many years by Novartis and the World Health Organization to provide free drugs mm -hmm. almost indefinitely yeah. for as long as there's leprosy. Do you have any idea of who might be going to fund this new drug combination and the, uh, the uh, introduction of it and the implementation over the next few decades? Yes. I think this really, it, it, yeah. Another great, all three questions would be great questions. Uh, I think that, um, of course, this pertains to any new drug. Uh, the reality is that there'll be no profits in this drug. Any drug, all the drugs that are given um, right now are given free. Okay? All drugs are given free. Therefore, the current drugs are given free. For example, uh, Sanofi, which makes Melasprol, gives it free. Okay? And they, they will do that at least till 90, uh, until 2020. All the other drugs are given free. Um, the revenue stream is likely to come from animal trypanosomiasis because they're, in fact, called animal because of the fact that it affects many more types. So the animal ones, and this, many the veterinarians are as interested as the human doctors in this thing. Um, it's a question that this often, I'm often asked. I would just assume that, um, that uh, uh, because WHO, of course, is not cash rich, as, as we know, so they're not going to do it. Okay? I think this will have to come from, from from the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies. The number of patients affected by the disease is going down, so hopefully there won't be that many. So, so one just assumes that they will continue. And uh, governments as well. Of course, the governments aren't too, uh, the governments don't have that much money to play with either, of course. Uh, but one imagines that there will be some kind of, as there is now, some government, NGO, WHO pressure to do this. It's something which I don't worry about, because I, I think if something is effective, I think it will be. Um, the problem is that the problem is that whenever I've tried to get pharmaceutical industry interested in this, they say, well, no, we're not interested because there's no profits. You know? mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's, it's an important question. I don't think it's going to be a problem. Uh, but, of course, I could be wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd just be happy if we get the first thing off the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a hand up, sir? Yes, gentleman here. I think you've partly answered this, but are you hopeful that the new drug will be effective against Nagana and will wipe that out as an pro economic problem in Africa? Um, one of the problems is that there were, th there were three drugs that are given for, for Nagana. Yeah. There, are three, there are three drugs that are given for animal trypanosomiasis at the moment. Uh, none of them is very good. Uh, uh, there's Baronel, uh, there's not, and there are two others. Um, all of these, and also Simon Larson was given for the CNS, right? Uh, they're all um, extremely ineffective. And, one, and it's a big problem because a lot of the drugs are, are given. I mean, there's resistance, and a lot of the drugs are maybe contaminated. They may not be, uh, there may be problems with them. Also, the common cause of weight loss of animals in that area is actually trypsomyces, so they're often given to animals that don't have it, so you get resistance mm -hmm. problems. There are a lot of problems. But Peter Holmes here is actually the great expert on this. Most of what I'm saying I learned from him. And, the, uh, and so I personally uh, think that, uh, that I'm hopeful that this drug will be good for animal, for animal uh, trypsomyces. For the CNS disease, okay, uh, uh, the CNS disease occurs in animals, in camels, in uh, mules, horses, donkeys, pigs and goats. I think, I think that's it. Um, 
I remember, and, and so, so especially uh, uh, of the, uh, for example, I don't think you could give this to, to milk-producing animals, okay, because you can't give it arsenic. And, and there are issues with animals because the fact that what people are worried about is the residual in what's, because they, you know, they, they pass uh, motions and things, and, and they're concerned with the contamination of, of, the, of the ground. That's, that is an issue. But nevertheless, uh, I have been having interesting discussions with, uh, with companies that are interested in giving animals. And it wouldn't even surprise me if this is trialed on animals. Um, and I think, uh, and that may even be a, a and, and if there's a revenue stream, that's where it's going to come from. For example, you know, I mean, you have to remember that trypanosome, trypanosomiasis doesn't only occur in Africa, you know. I mean, you know, there's, Max Morris has told me, for example, that vivax occurs in South America, and also, you also see trypanosomiasis in, in, in certain Arab countries. Um, and, you know, so you've got racing camels, and so there are all kinds of potential. Mm -hmm. So I think your question actually raises a lot of very interesting issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm afraid this will have to be the last question. Thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry if this isn't your field, but I was just wondering if you know with climate change if the tsetse flies could travel up into the Mediterranean and Europe. That's a very interesting question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's funny, it's funny to say that because when, I, when, when we're setting the lab up, okay, in the vet, I moved to the vet school a few years ago because I work in a hospital and everyone... They said, we're very unhappy about you working with these things. You know, what and when, when we got into the thing, they insisted that we made the lab fly-proof by having two lots. You know. And I said, do you really think that Cetifly is going to exist in this reef weather? You know? <laughs> I mean, Cetifly, can you imagine the last one minute? You know? <laughs> you know. uh, so basically, um, I think that, well, we certainly know that that's how West Nile got to America. In an overhead bin, these things came. They, you know, they were very resistant, right? As it happens, it's an interesting question because um, uh, the, uh, there are cases of um, there are cases of, of, of animal trips in South America. So presumably, uh, they did actually some have actually gone over, mm -hmm. not human, and that uh, uh, and historically very very interesting reasons for that. For example, during the slave trade, Winterbottom sign was had an apathy in humans and. So the slave traders would know who was infected and wouldn't have them interested in it. But the animal wants to come across. Mm -hmm. So I think the animals may come infected. Tessie flies, I think, uh, were probably, uh, probably not, uh, I think they're probably less, um, less adapted to the climates than the ones producing, you know, the vectors producing West Nile. But certainly, so far, you know, there has been movement of trips and mice itself within countries, you know, as I mentioned, within Uganda. But in terms of the, the fly belt, the, you know, was it 14 degrees north, 29 degrees south? It, for some reason, doesn't, doesn't get that area and doesn't go laterally to Madagascar. It seems to stay there. Mm. So they seem to be very sort of uh, fussy about where they live. <laughs> so it is kind of my, it kind of my feel. Climatic ch you asked about climate change. Uh, I suppose if everywhere got unbelievably warm, of course, that's what, you're, that's what you're really getting at, isn't it? If things got terribly warm in Europe, Glasgow, um, then maybe... <laughs> Then I might stay there. I might stay in Glasgow. <laughs> but then, in fact, what would happen is that potentially, but certainly, I think it's going to get much worse. It's in, in, interesting. Mm. Not for some time yet, but in the future, who knows? Maybe if it gets above the two degrees, you know, like three and four. And if that happens, what? Potentially, potentially, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anything's possible. But it, it is right now. It is all sub-Saharan. You know. Thank you very much, Professor Kennedy. Can I call on Professor Peter Holmes to give a vote of thanks? Hope you can see me at the back. Thank you very much indeed, President. Uh, Peter, thank you for a really splendid lecture. And I think it's really appropriate that it's, uh, the prize is, is Sir James Black, because I know personally that he very much admired what you did uh, and your work. And it's a, it's a wonderful link. It's a really impressive lecture. I think it gave a fantastic uh, overview of the problem um, across Africa. And it's a problem that, in fact, as Peter said, has a great links with Scotland, going back to Bruce, to, to Livingston. And, and Peter has helped continue, I think, what is a tremendous tradition of real international strength in trypanosomiasis research uh, within Scotland, um, particularly in Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Dundee. And uh, I think it's a, a wonderful example of what we might call One Health, because uh, many vets go to work in medicine, human medicine. Uh, Peter is a, a, is a great example of someone who's come, in fact, 
from human medicine and linked up with the vet school and, and is looking at this disease not only in humans, which is obviously his primary purpose, uh, but also this big animal connection because of the animal reservoir, because it's such a major disease, a disease in Africa. So that, I think, is, a, is we're re extremely fortunate that uh, a neurologist should become interested in a tropical African disease. And that, I, I know Max Murray uh, should probably deserve uh, some, of, some of the thanks, thanks for doing that. Um, I think you've illustrated also very nicely how you can go from laboratory work to the field. Uh, so many scientists are either based in labs and never get to the field or vice versa. And this is a really excellent example of going from very high science uh, right down to human cases in very difficult situations, as we know, in Africa. Um, I think you've also illustrated the kind of vagaries of trypanosomiasis. There's been periods, as you could see from the graph in, in the 60s, when people really thought this disease was going to disappear. And then for various reasons, and as you mentioned, the civil unrest, uh, migration of refugees, loss of medical services, and so on, the disease came back, and it came back very quickly. And again, now we're at a, at a period when everybody's getting extremely optimistic. Uh, WHO has allocated 17 neglected tropical diseases, and one of them is African, human African trypanosomiasis for not only intense control, but perhaps in the case of Gambienzi, elimination. So it's a hugely ambitious goal. And people are really quite optimistic by 2020, 2030, perhaps we'll be getting close to it, at least as a, as a public health problem. But of course, there are huge risks involved. Things can go wrong. Um, unrest, migrations, um, uh, and the, the disease could, could easily return again. So I think, I think there are lots of problems still, but I think we can also be optimistic. And I think I'd like to close by just quoting something from WHO who, who believed that the contribution of this new drug really is a stunning achievement. For so long, and because there's been no market in treatment uh, for big pharmaceutical companies, we've always been either using old drugs or we've been using drugs that have been used for something else. And here is an opportunity to really have a very effective drug, which is orally effective, and we congratulate you on, on what you've achieved. So thank you again for a superb lecture. Uh, every good wish with this drug. We hope it gets used in Africa. Thank you.